Santa Anna was very angry about the losses at San Antonio de Bayar and Goliad. He took these losses personal, and he sought to utterly defeat and embarrass Texas as a message to anyone else who might stand up to his authority as dictator. It did take him several weeks to get his army together and for the army to reach Texas, which gave Texans the time to prepare. Unfortunately, even with that time to prepare, there were many problems in the Texas army. The army did not have many soldiers. The Consultation of 1835 created an army, but it did nothing to actually recruit soldiers. The army was very disorganized. Volunteers picked their own commanders. They saw themselves as connected with their volunteer group. Sam Houston is in charge of the regular army, but not the volunteer groups. And many times after a battle ended, the troops went home instead of staying, seeing themselves as a committed professional army. There were also conflict, conflicting commands. The fight to remove Santa Ana, or was it a fight to be independent from Mexico? You know, depending on which group one sided with, they were going to pick that leader. Also, the Texas troops were scattered around the state and did not communicate with each other. When the Mexican army arrived at Texas in February of 1836, Santa Ana is going to have over 7,000 troops with him. It's, at the time, the largest army on the North American continent, and he is going to divide his forces. He is going to take 6,000 troops north towards San Antonio, while General Jose de Urea is going to take 1,000 troops and travel along the coast to Goliad. In San Antonio, the Texan troops are going to occupy the Alamo, an old abandoned mission, the one that was known as Mission of Viejo, that had been there since Spanish times. And the commander of the troops at the Alamo was a man by the name of Colonel James C. Neal, he had 104 soldiers and 21 cannons. Then, in January of seven, January 17, 1836, James Bowie is going to show up with an army of 30 soldiers. This is a volunteer army. Then, on February 3rd, Lieutenant Colonel William B. Travis, the same man from Anahuac, is going to arrive with 30 more soldiers, and who are specifically horsemen or cavalry, are there, and they represent the. Uh, official Texas Army. So Travis is operating under the command of Sam Houston. And then later, Davy Crockett, the famous frontiersman and former uh, representative from Congress out of Tennessee, is going to show up and he's going to have 12 men with him from Tennessee. There are also going to be nine Tejanos under Juan Seguin at the Alamo. The problem with all of these groups is each group has their own leader who they're going to look to for orders. So Davy Crockett, Seguin, Travis, James Bowie, and Neil are all going to have to work together, and that's hard to get all of them to agree on anything. In the middle of February 1836, Neil is going to return home, and he's going to leave his men under the command of Travis. So William Travis commands the most people, but he also still has to contend with Bowie and Crockett for decisions that each one sees themselves in charge of their groups. Sam Houston is going to send orders to Travis, and he's going to tell him you need to abandon the Alamo, that it's undefendable, but Travis feels, no, they could make a stand there, so he's going to disobey his orders from Sam Houston, and he's going to stay to defend the Alamo. On February 23rd, the Mexican soldiers are going to arrive in San Antonio, so that is going to make Travis's decision for him that he can't leave now because they're trapped. Also, James Bowie is going to become ser seriously ill. He's going to be confined to his bed for this dura the duration of the Battle of the Alamo, and he is going to turn his command over to William Travis. So Travis is now completely in charge. On February 23rd, Santa Ana will send a message to the men of the Alamo telling them to surrender. Travis will respond by a single cannon shot. He will fire off a cannon as a way to tell Santa Ana that the men of Texas, that the men of the Alamo will not surrender and that the fight is on. As a result, as Santa Ana's army is filling into San Antonio, the Alamo is going to have to work to defend itself. It had some very thick high walls in some places, but in other places the walls had crumbled and there was nothing. So they had to build like walls out of sticks and things to fill those in. Also, uh, 
Travis had 21 cannons at the Alamo, uh, and he had to defend a very large area with less than 200 men versus over 6,000 Mexican soldiers. Travis will send out a plea to the people of Texas asking for help. He will write a letter. Uh, he will send it out. He'll send it to Houston. He'll send it to Goliad, and he'll just send it to the people of the world asking for help, saying that it was detrimental that they had to defend the Alamo as a way to block Santa Ana's access to other parts of Texas. This letter, which we now call the Travis Letter, is known as the most heroic letter in Texas history. In it, uh, Travis says that they are outnumbered, that they need help, but they will never, you know, that they will never give up. They will fight to the death and, uh, you know, that they will never surrender, he says, and his last line is victory or death. And so it's become a very famous letter in Texas history. Some help will arrive. James Fannin had 300 minute Goliad. Uh, he sets out to help Travis at the Alamo, but he'll be forced to turn back and retreat to Goliad. Meanwhile, Lieutenant George C. Kimball will arrive with 32 men from the city of Gonzales. Um, uh, one of the messengers on March 3rd, Travis, will send out a letter to the convention of 1836 asking for help. He will send it with a man by the name of James Bonham, who will deliver the message but then return to the Alamo, where he will be a part of the fighting. Um, Santa Ana will fly a red flag, which meant no quarter. This way, the men in the Alamo knew that they would not be taken prisoner, that anyone who surrendered would be executed as a way to try to force them to leave. But they will stay. For 12 days, the Mexican army will bombard the Alamo as they lay siege to it. They will surround it and they'll hit it with cannons just day and night. On the night of March 5th, the end of those 12 days, Travis will hold, bring his men together in the area in the courtyard of the Alamo and the grounds there and he will tell his men that to stay means certain death and anyone who wants to leave can go. The legend is that uh, Travis took his sword and drew a line in the sand. Again, this is a legend. We don't know if it's real or not, but it's very popular in Texas history and said that anyone who wanted to stay needed to cross the line and anyone who didn't could stay behind it and of all the men in there, all of them chose to stay except for one person who left. The next morning is what we call Alamo Day. It is the fall of the Alamo on March 6, 1836. At 5 a.m., Santa Ana's men, his buglers, sounded the charge, and 1,800 Mexican soldiers attacked the Alamo, which was defended by less than 200 Texans. The battle lasted about 90 minutes. Uh, around 180 Texans died. William Travis, James Bowie, who was again sick in bed, but he died fighting in his bed. Davy Crockett, everyone died, uh, except for a few people, uh, one of whom was a man by the name of Brigado Guerrero, who was a Tejano, who was fighting at the Alamo. He was captured and he convinced Santa Ana that he, that he had been forced to fight against his will, and so Santa Ana allowed Guerrero to leave. Another person who survived was a woman by the name of Susanna Dickinson. She was the wife of one of the officers there. Uh, also, she had their small daughter, Angelina. Uh, the wives of two other soldiers will also survive, as does Joe Travis, the slave of William Travis. And so he is allowed to leave. He is also freed by Santa Ana, that he had been, Travis had been a slave, Joe Travis had, and now he's free. Susanna Dickinson is going to provide one of the earliest firsthand accounts of the fall of the Alamo. She's going to tell how these people died um, and talk about the heroic deaths of them. One of the things that's interesting is another person, though, who will give a firsthand account is a man by the name of Jose de la Pena. He's a Mexican colonel who will keep a journal which would get published in the 1970s where he talked about his travels in Texas with Santa Ana and he talks about the, uh, the fall of the Alamo and in it 
De La Pena says that several, a small group of defenders got trapped in one of the rooms. They were captured, and uh, when they were asked what to do with them, that Santa Ana ordered their execution, and so they were executed also. Why this was a, a this actually was controversial because one of the people who he said surrendered and were then executed was Davy Crockett, who Susanna Dickinson had talked about Davy Crockett dying this heroic death, fighting off uh, the Mexican soldiers, which had been made into movies and other events in Texas history, uh, and so it contradicted the death of Davy Crockett and is a very controversial event in Texas history now. But with the fall of the Alamo, there is now a new battle cry and rallying point for Texas, which is remember the Alamo. While Santa Ana was attacking the Alamo, General Urea will march up the Texas coast towards the town of Goliad. Urea first defeated a small group of Texans at San Patricio, then another group at Agua Dulce Creek. Civilians in the area were afraid, and they asked James Fannin and his troops at Goliad for help. Fannin will send Amos B. King and a small force to bring the citizens to safety. While he's out, King will meet Uriah's army, and he'll get trapped at Refugio. By dividing his troops, James Fannin will violate a direct order from Sam Houston, who had ordered him to get his men and retreat towards Washington on the Brazos, where Houston's men were organizing. Fannin will send a hundred men to help King, but in the fight, King and most of his men uh, will be killed, along with the men led by a man by the name of Ward, who Fannin had sent to help King. They will also be killed or captured. Meanwhile, Fannin is going to tell the government that he wants to leave Goliad, but the Texas Provisional Government will order him to stay. So he will. Then, when the Alamo falls, the Provisional Government will order Fannin that he needs to retreat to Guadalupe. Fannin, though, will not retreat immediately. He will wait for several days to see if King and Ward might return. So he delays. When he finally leaves Goliad on March 19, 1836, he sets out, but instead of abandoning his heavy equipment, he tries to take everything with him, including his cannons, worried that Santa Ana may be able to use the supplies. So Fannin takes everything, and because he's so overloaded, he goes very slowly, his wagons break down, and on March 19th, his troops are tired, and he allows them to stop and rest in the middle of an open field at a place called Coletto Creek. While they're there, he will be surrounded by Uriah's men, uh, Uriah had over 1,000 troops. They're going to surround it in what will become known as the Battle of Coletto Creek. Fannin's men will pull everything into a circle. They will fight for a day, keeping the Mexican troops at bay. But that night, the Texans had little water, little food, and a freezing rain will hit. So on March 20th, 1836, the next morning, when the Mexican army starts using their cannons and opening fire on Fannin's men, Fannin realizes they don't have much chance, and he will surrender and lose at the Battle of Coletto Creek. They will be marched back to Goliad, where Santa Ana will send word saying that no rebel shall be left alive. So Fannin and his men are in Goliad at the Presidio. They're now prisoners in their own Presidio, and Santa Ana sends the message to execute all of the prisoners. So on March 27, 1836, under the trick that they are to be released. They give up their guns and 340 men are marched in three columns into three different directions out of Goliad into the fields where suddenly the Mexican soldiers turn and open fire and slaughter them. And of the 340 men, only 28 will manage to escape. The other roughly 312 will be slaughtered and die. With the losses at the Alamo and Goliad, these are massive losses for Texas to have everyone uh, slaughtered so much. It is going to have an impact on the Texas Revolution, though. One, Santa Ana is going to feel overconfident after these victories. He feels that Texas offers no resistance to him. The Texans, on the other hand, are going to be inspired by the stand at the Alamo and outraged at the slaughter at Goliad. As a result, now 
they're going to rally around the ideas of both the Alamo and the Goliad. And for Sam Houston, the losses are going to show the troops under him that they do need to listen to Sam Houston. They need to become trained. They need to become a real army. And it's going to bring everyone together under his command, which will allow him to have a better effort fighting against Santa Ana. But for Texans at this point, things aren't looking very good in the revolution.